We're going to start something, in a, a different study today. And um, you know, the, the thing that's on my heart for myself and for the body of Christ, not, I mean, here, but even beyond, is how do we get closer to the heart of God? I mean, I, I want, I, I just don't want to get to heaven and look back on my life and realize I missed, I missed some of the best things um, in serving God. I don't want to do that. I don't want to wait till I need God in some shape or form and realize I'm lacking in relationship. I want everything that God has for me. I really do. Catch up faith, don't work. Never does. You can't catch up, ever. Can't catch up. The Bible says now faith. Now faith is the substance. So faith has got to be now. Faith has got to be real, and it's got to be in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, all right. We're going to start today in Isaiah chapter 46. Chapter 46. I gotta find my notes here. There we go. Yep. Okay, we're gonna start with verse one. And it says this. Isaiah, I said, book of Isaiah, chapter 46, starting with verse 1. Bel boweth, boweth down, and Nebo stoopeth. Their idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy laden, they are burdened. To the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together, they could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. So, people of this day, if you remember um, some of these Babylonian, Assyrian Babylonian gods, anybody ever hear of a man named Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, yep, it's all over the book of Daniel. The first part of his name is Nebo, and he's dedicated to this god, Nebo. Now, he had a grandson named Belshazzar. Remember? Daniel's name was transferred from Daniel to the Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, which is honoring the god of Bel. The god of Bel, the god of Nebuchadnezzar. They were very common. So, Isaiah is going to come up and say, this is what you guys do. You guys uh, find a bunch of gold, you find a bunch of silver, and you put it in a melting pot, you hire a goldsmith or what have you, and they make you a god, and that's your god. Where's he at? Where's he at? Bell's been destroyed. They're, they're all been destroyed. But these were gods of the future, and, uh, uh, or uh, of the past, that um, these people worshipped just because they invented one. And they thought, and maybe, maybe they had some kind of demonic inspiration to uh, come up with these things, but they weren't the one and true God. So Isaiah is saying, now this is 200 years, 200 years before Babylon came. He said this. He said all this, okay? So, Bel, sometimes his name is Marduk. He comes um, from uh, a, a somatic meaning, a somatic word meaning Lord, and he was thought to be uh, the God of order and destiny. Okay, that's who Bel is. Okay, Nebo or Nebu was a major god of the Assyrian Babylons. Did you ever see a, a, a real skinny guy and he's got a tablet? If you ever look at some of these uh, uh, pictures that they wrote, and this was him. He was like a scribe. And he's over here and he's writing down all the things. And he reports back to his 
to, to the other gods, um, Bel, or we would call it sometimes Baal. You ever hear Baal, B-A-A-L in the scripture? Baal is Nebo's father, father and son, these two. And so he reports to his dad, and, his, uh, and he tells him everything, and Bel puts the destiny of that man. If, if Bonnie's a good woman, maybe good things will come her way. But if I, if I don't like her, even though she's good, I'll bring bad things her way. So Nebo ascribes everything, the destiny, that's purpose for this person. So God, when God says they fall down and they stoop, they're busted down, all the religious nonsense of what Nebo might have said to her or a priest might have said to her that she's evil and she's bad, all those things fall down before the Lord. Because to God, every one of you have value, right? And that's what he's saying. Those gods all fall down. They all buckle. They all go down. Um, we've seen in, in uh, Scripture where they took the ark of God and they brought it before Dagon. Remember Dagon? He was a merman. And, um, and um, they came back the next morning and Dagon is bowed down before the ark of God. So, uh, well, wind must blew last night. So, pick him back up, set him back up. Next day to come up, and his head's missing and his hands are missing. God took care of him. God took care of him. Because everything bows before God. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Amen? So, bow, so all these gods, Nebo, um, let's see here. He was a major god in the Syrian Babylon. His symbol was the clay tablet and the stylus, you know, the pen that he wrote on. Um, he... he inscribes the fates of men by the gods. The word Nebo means to speak or speaking. And, uh, and Bel, or Marduk, was the father of Nebo. Okay. So I want you to see this, how that all these gods of the past, from the time Babylon or Babel started, they were creating these gods. We're in Revelation, we're talking about these false religions um, that started up where Revelation says she's the mother of harlots. Mother of harlots. Mother of all these gods that are going to come around and try to deceive you. There's hardly a religion on the earth today that doesn't worship the mother and the child. There's hardly a religion. You find it in all the Asian cultures. You find it in Africans. You, you find it everywhere. I, I didn't even realize it, it, it was so vast because it started in Babel and it was the mother of all these. The mother of all harlots. The scarlet harlot, right? So these gods that people dream up or de demonic um, forces impress on people to make these idols, God said it's going to fall down. Now I'm going to show you the proof of the pudding, how you know God exists. How does God know he exists? This is Mother's Day. We're worshiping mothers, right? Let, let's go to verse 3. I shouldn't say worshiping mothers. We're honoring mothers. <laughs> We're honoring mothers. That was a poor word. Okay, verse 3. Now look at this. <clears throat> Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnants of the house of Israel. So, O house of Jacob. Jacob had a daddy, right? His daddy was Isaac. Isaac had a daddy. His name was Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the founding fathers of the nation of Israel, right? So he says, oh, house of Israel, listen to me. God called Abraham, took him out of the land of Ur, and he started a whole brand new nation. He's the very first one, right? He's the patriarch of all of Israel. His wife, Sarai, was later changed to Sarah, was the matriarch, okay? So now look, look, at, look at this. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, 
which are born, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. Boy, look at Abraham. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham's name was Abram before it was changed to Abraham, right? God is good at, at renames, nicknames, whatever you want to call them. God's really good at it. He gets a guy, Abraham, or Abram, and says, Hey, I'm going to make a nation out of you. And there's your wife. Uh, she's a real honey over here. And um, she's going to be the matriarch of this whole entire nation. You know, they're hooking up and everything like that. No children, no children, no children. God keeps returning and saying, Sorry, you know, uh, God, I, I, we haven't had a child yet. You want to bless me, but I got all this gold and I got all this money, I got all this wealth, but I don't have no children to, to, to leave this to. So finally, when Sarah's 90 years old, 90 years old, you know, if I was going to prophesy, we'll just use the people in here, and, um, and I would say, hey, you know what, my, my granddaughter, Sadie, um, I'm going to prophesy and say, hey, someday she's going to have a child. Is that hard to believe? And probably not. She's going to grow up. She's going to be in the childbearing years. And, and she'll probably have... If, if Lily over here, if I had said to her, Lily, someday I'm going to prophesy again. Oh, she'll probably be a dad, dad. No, a mom. She's probably going to be a mom. Okay. She might be a mom someday. If I would tell you that Beth or Sandy was going to have a child someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, could have, they could still have children. If I would come up to here and sit there and say, oh, Kelly. <laughs> you know, she's barely 29. Um, she could have a child. So if I would come up here and sit there and say, well, Margie, you know. You, you <laughs> so <is> Sarah. <laughs> and I would say, if is you know what she did when I said you, you're going to have a child? You know, her and Marvin's going to hook up and you're going to have a baby next year when you come back. Oh, boy. And, uh, <laughs> she gave away all her baby clothes. Yeah, she, <laughs> she gave away all her baby clothes, she said. It would be harder to believe, right? It would be harder to believe. We can understand that a young woman is going to have children sometimes. But not 90-year-old women usually just don't have too many children anymore. So Sarah comes up there, and a year later, she has a child. What does that mean? God made a nation. Look at what I'm talking. God made a nation out of barrenness. He, out of barrenness. When he brought the children out of Egypt to Canaan land, the land was barren. He used a man and a woman who was barren, and he made her fruitful. Right? She had a child. So that's in, uh, I'll go back here and read this to you. In Genesis chapter 11, I believe, if I remember right, i got to have to look this up. Uh, it's given the genealogy of, of Abraham. And, uh, and it said uh, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 30, it says, But Sarai, now that was her name before God changed it, Sarai was barren, and she had no child. That's a really poor choice to try to make a nation out of, right? Someone who's barren. And, uh, but yet God did it. So she has a child. And when God told her that she's going to have a child, she started laughing. So she named her son Laughter. That's what Isaac means, Laughter. So Isaac gets married. Sarah dies. Abraham finds a, a wife for his son. And his name, her name was Rebecca. And guess what? Rebecca's barren too. I mean, just runs in the family, doesn't it? She can't have children. Um, i got to find that. It's Genesis 25. Uh, I'm not sure I wrote it down. Um, 
that that I got to find this here that she was that she was she was barren three score years anyhow it's twenty five said uh, that Rebecca was barren she couldn't have no children. So then she finally has a set of twins. God opens her womb. She has a son, two sons, Esau and Jacob, who's going to be later, his name's going to be changed to uh, Israel. Absolutely. He marries a woman that he falls in love with, and her name is Rachel. She's barren too. She's barren too. Sarah couldn't have children. Rebecca couldn't have children. And Rachel could not have children. So when Isaiah 43 says this, that God himself has borne Israel. A lot of people think, well, he bore him. You know, he carried him. He bore him on his shoulders. No, he's the one that opened the womb of Sarah at her old age. She's the one that had this miraculous birth. And that's what God can do. He takes what's barren in our life and he makes the barrenness fruitful. And these are why we have have to have a relationship with God. Bell could never do that. Nebo could never do that. Dagon could never do that. We never see fruit. You don't see um, uh, Islam proclaiming anything like that. You know why? Because their gods aren't real. They don't exist. God bore a nation out of barrenness, out of nothing. Out of nothing, out of the impossibilities. You want to talk about how God exists? There's some proof right there. Because this just can't happen. 90-year-old women just don't get pregnant. Just don't get pregnant. And then to have a child successfully, how would you like to chase one, a little infant around all day long? Boy, that would wear you out by 10 o'clock in the morning, wouldn't it? <laughs> but she did it. So this is all God. Okay, now look at what uh, Isaiah has to say about this. That God bore this. God wants to take the barrenness of our life and our spiritual life, and he wants to put life back in it. Verse 3, hearken to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnants of the house of Israel. That's you guys. We're, We're grafted in, right? which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. Now look at this. Look at what he's going to say here. That I carried you, or who, which are carried from the womb. So from your mama's womb, when you were in your mother's womb, even to your old age, I am he. And even to the whore hairs. Do you ever see the hoar frost? It's like a silver. Even to the gray of your hair, he's saying, I'm going to carry you, I'm going to bear you, I'm going to bore you, I'm going to carry you from the womb all the way to your old age. That's what God's saying. I want to carry you. I want to be a sidekick to you. I want to walk with you. I want to, and, and that's what I was saying when I was praying before. You know, for us to walk with God, we've got to be in the same place that God's at. God can't be over here and I'd be over there and expect to walk with him. I can't we got to be at the same place he is. I've got to be at the same path that he's walking, and i got to walk at the same pace that he's walking if I'm going to be with God, right? So from the womb to the gray hair, I will carry you. I have made, I will bear, even I will carry, and I will deliver you. Woo! Isn't that amazing to know what God wants to do for us? You know what God wants to do when you got a little sick child saying, hey, you know what, he's got cancer, and the doctor says, I don't think he's going to live. And if he does have surgery, and he's probably going to be a vegetable the rest of his life. God said, I'll carry him. I'll carry him. And look at that little boy. He's, he's just an amazing testimony. What God done? I'll carry you. To whom will you liken me and to make me equal and compare me? that we may be like. They lavish gold out of bag and weigh silver in the balance and they hire a goldsmith and they make it a god. And they fall down, yea, they worship. 
They bear them on his shoulders. They carry him and set him in place. And he standeth from his place shall not be moved. Yea, one shall carry him and he cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. These gods are useless. Pretty much what he's saying. Now look at this. Verse 8. Remember this. Remember this. And show yourselves men. So, but John, we don't make gold idols no more. No, now we make our gold or we make our idols out of aluminum, and we put a, a, you know a, the name of bass fisher or bass boat or on him, and we worship that. We spend all our time with that, or we, we'll call it a, um, you know a four wheeler, and we make all these different things that we spend all our time with. All these things, and we forget all about the God who saves. So we don't have to have a, you know, a gold image to worship. I can worship anything. I could spend all my time in my truck and forget that this church even exists if I choose to. Now that'd be foolishness, wouldn't it? That'd be foolishness. But there's things that can rob me of my time and can rob me of my relationship with God, okay? None of them can do me any good, can't profit me, anything like that. But this relationship with God is. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none, uh, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times to the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures, now look at verse 11. Calling a ravenous bird from the east. Ooh, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man. So it's not talking about a bird. He's comparing a man to a ravenous bird. Something that's hungry, something that's going to go and devour, right? Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it, I will bring it to pass, and I have purposed it, and I will also do it. You know what he's talking about there? Back up to 44, chapter 44, and look at verse 28. Yep, chapter 44, verse 28 says, That saith of Cyrus. Cyrus, he's talking about a different king from a different nation. See, Isaiah's prophesying something here that they're going to be carried away from these dumb idols, Bel and Nebo. Those are who the Babylonians worshipped. And they're going to carry them away. But God said they're going to stoop down and they're going to bow down before me. They're going to fall down. 200 years. Isaiah wrote this 200 years before it happened. While this is all going on in a different land, in Persia. Persia is Iran. Is, is Iran. So you got Israel over here, you got the Dead Sea, you got Jordan, you got Iraq, you got Iran. It's a long way off. Way over there is the king, Xerxes. He asks his wife to go ahead and dance for all of his friends, and she refuses, so they get rid of her. So they said, well, we got to find another bride for our king. You know, he gets cranky without his wife around. So they start having a contest. I said, let's find the most beautiful woman we can find. Let's, let's find one that's just going to woo him. And they do. You know who they find? Esther. Queen Esther. <laughs> this was all prophesied before anything happened. Before anything happened. So Esther comes along and she marries this king and she has a son. You know what they named him? Cyrus. Cyrus. Yep. Named him Cyrus. And when, I, when Cyrus was king, and he looked into the Jewish scriptures, and he realized his name was written 200 years before he was ever born, he said, there must be a God in Israel. There must be a God. Because the gods of Nebo and Baal can't do anything like that. 
And he gave the command to go back and build that country, go back and build that city, go back and build it. So they did. This is what he did. So he was that ravenous wolf. He said, he, he that saith of Cyrus, he's my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, the foundation be laid. That's what he said. When Israel was formed in 1948, they called, uh, Harry Truman called the president of Israel and said, I am Cyrus. Tell me what you need. And the United States gave them everything they needed to protect themselves. Because all the other um, Arabian countries were furious that Britain gave that land back to Israel. And they became a state again. But it was prophesied. Isaiah said, shall these bones live again? Shall these bones? Ezekiel 37. Shall these bones live again? Shall they be born in a day? Sure did. One day. They had a nation again. <coughs> Look at 48. 45 verse 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of the king to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. This is all prophesied. So when we get over here to, to 46, we realize that God birthed the country God birthed the nation out of barrenness. Out of barrenness. He brought them to a land that was completely barren. Everything was barren in this. And when we all wrap this all up, we're going to spend some time in chapter 35, where he says, the desert's going to bloom again. <laughs> The desert's going to bloom. The wilderness is going to be a fruitful place. And he's going to bring life to everything. God is life. You know that when he made Adam, he formed him out of the dust of clay, and all that was was a dirt statue, right? It's just an image of a, of a man, just dirt, until God touched it. God breathed into his nostrils. He became a living man, right? When Sarah was barren, 90 years old, couldn't have it. God spoke. The breath came out of him. She became pregnant and had a child. Rebecca couldn't have children. She was barren. They entreated of the Lord. He spoke it. She comes pregnant. Not only pregnant, but she has twins. Isn't that amazing? Rachel, she's gone her whole life. She's watching all her sister Leah have all these babies. The handmaidens have babies and everything like that. And here she is wondering, God, what is wrong with me? And finally... God spoke <laughs> and opened her womb. He bears out of barrenness. I want you to know that. He bears out of barrenness. Those things that, are, that we're praying for, you know, that spouse that just seems like he won't ever get saved or she won't ever get saved, um, that problem that seems so big that we don't know how we're going to get past that, God brings life out of barrenness. I want you to understand and have this hope and this peace in you that whatever you're seeking God for, He is able. He's able. He is able. He's more than able. God is able to bring to life those things. Amen? Your brother's cancer is, not, is, is little. You know what we call God? We call Him King of Kings. And you know what we think in our mind? Well, He's the King of all the other kings. That's, that's what we think of. That he, well, he's, he's king over king over king over king. You know, he's going to rule over all the kings. But it's not just that. He is God and he will reign over every man, regardless if you've got kingship or not. But Isaiah 53 says, surely he's borne all our griefs. Surely all of our sorrows, the chastisement of us, are upon him. You know what that means? That he's the king of cancer. You know what that means? He rules over it. He rules over cancer. He rules over whatever sickness, whatever disease we might have. He rules over those things. And he brings life back into those barren things or those bad reports that we give. He brings life to those things. Because through that, he shows the whole world 
that I am real. I am here, and I'm bigger than any mountain, right? I'm bigger than any city. You know, he could have brought Israel through the land of Philistines. When he brought them out of Egypt, we talked about that. He could have brought them around, but he did not. He went right through a sea. Right through a sea. Isn't that amazing? He brought them right through. He's showing them off. I'm God. There's nothing that's big enough for me. This obstacle, this barrenness, it's nothing too big enough for me. Right? Now, this is important to know. This is important to know. Because sometimes we go to God in prayer for some pretty big things, and we wonder, is, are you able? Can God heal a headache? Uh, it's a headache. Yeah, probably. Can he cure a stage four cancer? Uh, it, it's not any bigger. To God, it's not any bigger. Whether it be a headache or be any, it's not it's nothing any bigger. Okay. <coughs> Calling a ravenous bird from the east, a man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yeah, I've spoken it, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed it, and I will do it. Hearken unto me, you stout hearted, you stubborn, that are, uh, that are far from righteousness. I will bring my righteousness, it shall not be, cut up, be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. But I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. I'll bring my salvation. I'm going to bring it. And there's nothing you can do. Now, I want you to look at verse 8, where it said, Show yourself to be men. You know what that means? Stop acting stupid. I'm just putting this in layman's terms. Stop being dumb. Stop acting like a kid. Stop being dumb. Act like a man. Grow up. That's what he's saying. You know what 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says? You can go there and look if you want. It says the same way. Quit to be men. Quit acting stupid and act like a man. And then it goes on to say, and be strong. See, God don't want us just to be men, but he wants you to be strong men. He wants you to be strong. He doesn't want you to be weak in your faith. He wants you strong in your faith. You know what a weak in faith is? An accident waiting to happen. It really is. Because you got someone's weak in faith and they say, well, I'll, I'll pray for you. And usually they don't even do that. They'll say, hey, I'll bring them to church and let the pastor pray for them. That's what I'll do. Because I don't want to step out in faith and have to pray out loud to somebody. I don't want to do that. And, uh, or, I, you know, what if, what if God doesn't show up? You know, what if he doesn't show up and then I look like a fool? You know, um, and, and, people, and people do that. Because, for one, they don't have an answer. And the Bible says we're supposed to bring an answer for our calling, for our faith. We're supposed to be, bring an answer to, to all those things. We're supposed to have a reason why we know that God is real, that why God exists. What, do you know that before God formed anything? Before he formed anything, there was nothing. Complete vacuum, complete nothingness. That means there's no law of gravity. There's no gravity. No gravity. Hugh Ross, he's an astrophysicist in Caltech. And when, let's call it the Big Bang happened, God said, let there be light. And bam, everything existed. Let the plants be formed. Bam, and everything was. When all this happened, prior to that, there's nothing. So when this expanse took place, and we know the earth had a beginning, this, this universe had a beginning, because it's still going out, because God never said to stop. So if it's still growing, it had to have a beginning. We know that now, okay? So at the time he said, let there be, huh, I, I, I forgot, the, the atomic second that would had to be, that gravity had to be in place, and it had to be perfectly fine-tuned the way it is. If it was too great, everything would have imploded on itself. And if it would have been any less, nothing would have formed. Now, what's the chances of that happening to the point zero, 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 with like 50-some zeros behind it? That, that's how accurate it had to be. And the chance factor of this, the moon from the Earth to where the moon sits is... Oh, 
240,000 miles away, approximately. If you took North America, just North America, and stacked dimes in all of North America, and stacked those dimes all the way to the moon, and you got to blindfold yourself, mark one of them with a pen, you know, paint it red or something, you got to swim through the United States and find that dime. Now the thing is, is you also need another uh, 200,000 North Americas. You've got to swim through all of them, all 200,000 other planets to find that one dime. That's the chance factor that that gravitational force happened at that exact, precise, micro second of time. It's impossible. It never could have happened. It never could have happened. If you have an intelligent universe, you had to have an intelligent designer. The proof is out there if you're looking for it. The proof is out there. So we got to bring this, this uh, knowledge with us to have an answer for our calling to say, only God could have done this. We know Baal can't do that. We know uh, 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 Marduk, uh, Nebo, all those other gods that throughout the Bible we read about we're just made. But when we see a God that made a nation out of barrenness, you know, a barrenness, that, that, that's the proof of the pudding right there. If you'd say, uh, Bobby and Beth are going to form a nation, and they ended up with three kids, and those three kids ended up with 100 kids, and then three, that 100 kids, then, okay, yeah, you had two barren. But to take a barren woman at 90 and start making a, a nation out of that? To be able to have the offspring of that relationship just happen to find another woman of all the people on the planet, that's barren. Everyone's barren. But God took the barrenness and he made a nation out of it. And through that nation came a Messiah. And from the Messiah came everlasting life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's something that only God can do. That's something only God can do. Man, did my time burn up quick. My time burns up so fast here. Praise God. Um, I'm going to go to Ephesians. Because there's something that 1 Corinthians said that Isaiah did not say. He said, quit to be men. Quit to be men and be strong. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says, finally, my brethren, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. And this is where our strength has to, to reside in. Not in physical strength, right? But in spiritual strength. The older I get, the weaker I become. <laughs> the older I get, the, the more things I'm realizing, boy, this, this, this is harder than I thought it was going to be. And... Uh, and, and <laughs> so, so no matter how strong a man is, there can always be someone stronger. So we're talking about my faith. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand. Stand. This is what they're saying. Quit to be men. Stand and be strong against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in that evil day. And having done all to stand, verse 14, stand, stand, quit and be men. Grow up in your faith. Grow up in your faith and show yourself that you're men. Show yourself that you're just not men, but you're spiritual men. When the devil comes up and sees Arnie up here, that devil better quake. Because he knows he's got the power of God in him. Remember the axe? There, there's a guy who was possessed of the devil. And he said, well, we'll go over and cast him out. And uh, he said, you come out of that there, man. And he said, well, you know, uh, Jesus we know. Saul we know. But who are you? Remember that? Who are you? And they stripped that guy naked and ran him out of town. The devils did. The devil better know who you are. In Christ Jesus. 
in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's all in Christ Jesus. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we go on. Everybody get fed today? Everybody? Hands up. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Father God, there is none like you. Father, I first pray for all the mamas. All the mamas. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you be with every one of them, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that you bless them, you keep them, give them a joyful day today, oh Lord. Show them your power, show them your glory. Oh Lord, give them all your heart, Lord, the desires of your heart. Father, I pray in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that their families be strong, that they're healthy in spirit. Father God, that in Jesus' name, no weapon that is ever formed against them would prosper. And every tongue that rises up against them in judgment, Lord God, you would condemn. For this is the heritage of the saints. Oh, Lord, bless the womb of the child that lies therein. Father, bring us back again. Make us blabbermouth for your great kingdom. Keep us in the hollow of your hand. And Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise for all things. In Jesus' name, amen.